Yeah. You gotta work. You gotta work. Ride, shine, it's mine. Gotta show everybody it's my time. Get in here, you gotta work. Grind, shine, never mind who talking down, cause they lie. Don't talk, you gotta work. Welcome to Let's Talk with Carl Lee, where sports, culture, and community intersect. Join Carl and frequent co-host Hollis Lewis as they dive into engaging conversations with guests from all walks of life. Let's Talk is proudly presented by attorney Frank Walker. Real talk, real experience, real results. FrankWalkerLaw.com. Let the conversation begin on Let's Talk. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Let's Talk with Carl Lee and... Today, we are going to have a very interesting interesting show. It's going to be a two-part show. And um, Hollis. Yes, sir. I am, I am looking forward to, to, to this show. I have, for a couple of reasons, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to still do a little bit more of the intro, but yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to let you know, like, when you sent me all the information, I was like, huh, mm-hmm. this could be interesting. Yeah. And, and. And one of the things that I liked about it, and I don't know if you were purposely trying to do it, is it's it is sports that are outside of what people would like to say are the major sports, but but they are really really growing. Yeah, growing in important sports, I think, to our I agree uh, new lexicon of what we consider those mainstream sports. Right, I I, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Let's talk is sponsored by. Attorney Frank Walker, Real Talk, Real Experience, Real Results. You can visit frankwalkerlaw.com. You can also, um, you can check, you can check our show out on wchsnetwork.com. And you can also go on Facebook and you can catch Let's Talk every Sunday at 1 p.m. and every Thursday at 7 p.m. on 580 WCHS. All right, so today's show, my co-host and I, Hollis. Yes, sir. We are honored. We are honored to have, a, like I said, a couple of different folks on the show. But the first guest is going to be Candace Morse, who is at an early age, had a a huge passion for exercise. Therefore, motivated her into running. She now run track at Capitol High School. Yeah, West Virginia track or, record holder and and West Virginia record holder. Yeah. Now and and here's the here's the interesting thing because you know I was I I thought I was a track guy right. Yeah. I ain't never break no records, okay? (laughs) Let me me, me say that. I thought, you know, and I really thought I was pretty good, Mm -hmm. you know. But again, I ain't break no records, you know. And this young lady, Candace, has broken the record, the state record, Mm -hmm. and attends West Virginia State, which West Virginia State track is kind of like – Renewed there, yeah. So because yeah. you know, and, mm-hmm. and 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 in part, I'm going to make the case that this generation is is what's bringing it back. Am yeah. I wrong? Yeah, I would say that. So, and, and Candace, what? So you said you had an early uh, passion for exercise. Now, what in the world? Motivate anybody at an early age. I mean, I love sports, but I ain't love exercising. So, where did that come from? Um, Well, whenever I was younger, I used to run around the kitchen in circles and circles and circles and circles. Mm -hmm. So, my mom, she had signed me up for the Capital City Striders. Mm -hmm. And my first day of practice, I just cried the whole time. I was like, this is hard. I want to go home. I can't do this. So, I think maybe a year or two later, my mom took me back and I started running. And then ever since then, I've been running. Yeah, and, and that's a really tough program. I mean, you, if you talk about coaches who are passionate, dedicated, um, and just an organization that's really, really good. It's Capital City Striders is one of those organizations. There's, there's, no, there's no question about yeah. it. What? Okay, so typically when, when, when people say like they like exercise, you know, and, and they run – Usually that's more on the distance side than than it is. That's true. Good point. Uh, 
more than like like I'll go out now, you know, and I used to could I used to could run again, but like I said, I ain't break no records. But I used to I used to run, I used to run track. But like now I like I'll go out and, and jog and and go some distance to kind of just for exercise. Mm-hmm. That's totally different. And again, age has a whole lot to do with this mm-hmm. too, but what what was it when did you figure out like you could you were into the sprints and and that you could be good at it? Um, I like to win. So <laughs> nice. okay. that motivated me. Um, I didn't like to lose, and whenever I would lose, I would try as hard as possible to win the next time. So when you first started out and you started running, mm-hmm. so you had some bumps then. You, then you, you, you weren't winning. You didn't start out necessarily winning and, and having success like started like right from the beginning. Oh, I won, I won, I won, I won. But mm-hmm. you had some losses, mm-hmm. which then in turn made you have to work harder. Yeah, I think I had a teammate that I used to run with for the Striders, and we would go neck and neck. So she motivated me at practice to run harder and to beat her. Yeah, iron sharp is iron. And what, yeah. what events uh, do you run? What, what are your events? Well, I used to be a one, two, four runner, mm-hmm. and then I stopped running the 400. So now I just run the one, the two, and the four by one. But I think this upcoming season, my track coach is going to have me running the 400. Okay. And you say track coach, so and you, as we mentioned earlier, you're a track athlete at West Virginia State University. Now, that is an upstart. Again, track at West Virginia State is kind of, it's, it's there one year, gone the next. Mm-hmm. So you are on the, re, the revitalization of it. What made you choose? I mean, being a record holder in high school, what made you choose, hey, I'm going to go to West Virginia State? to excuse me continue my career well see at first I wanted to go to an out-of-state school but then my senior year I had got injured and I wasn't able to run as well as I thought I was going to run can we ask what the injury was I um sprained my ankle and pulled my hamstring oh okay yeah so I had that problem and then the track coach at state he had called me and was like telling me about the program and I was like okay this sounds good so I committed I was the first person to commit to the track program and then after that a whole bunch of people started to commit and then I got down there and I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot more about track whatever I got into college and, and you guys had an excellent year I mean like I said to be a a, a first year program I mean like I said I, I watched you guys through our social media, you guys, I, I don't know if you won the conference, but I think you competed for uh, conference titles and mm-hmm. various track meets. You, we actually came out on top. Mm-hmm. So, so how was that experience? Like I said, just being being new on campus and you know actually actually being pretty good. It was amazing. Um, I started off the season very nervous, but then as it went on, I started to gain more confidence and I started to enjoy it a lot, and I learned. Like I said, a lot about track that I didn't know in middle school or high school or from AAU sports. So the you, the comment that you made about being confident, you started to gain confidence. That is that is and and, and Hollis, we've talked about the, the the reasoning or the purpose for confidence, and some people can can take it even as arrogant sometimes. Um, but there's a confidence that tells you that you that something inside of you tells you that you can be something. It tells you that like, okay, I can do that. When you have that, sometimes people people look at it or or it sounds they don't like the way you walk, the way you act, or whatever. But when you took that, when you when you started thinking, man, I think I can do this, and I think I can be pretty good. Mm-hmm. That confidence, when you when you when you walk on the track, what are you thinking? Like, are are you are you are you thinking about being the absolute best? Uh, what, what is what is that mindset? Being in that mind of of already thinking, okay, I I'm going to be good. I'm, I'm I think I'm pretty good. Where does that take you? In a track meet or when you walk out on the track? 
Well, track is a very mental sport. It's individual, so it's all on you. If you go on the track with the mindset of you're not going to do good <clears throat> or you're nervous, then that's how you're going to do. So I just had to change my mindset and tell myself whenever I get on the track, I'm going to do well, regardless of what's going on or regardless of what's going on with the team. I have to do well on my own. And, and there was a little bit of an added pressure. Like I said, we mentioned that, again, this is a new sport at West Virginia State right. University. Mm-hmm. And you are, for lack of better words, the lottery pick. You are the uh, one, at least one of the premier athletes on the team. So that was an extra. Mm-hmm. Was that an added pressure? Did you feel that? How was dealing with that? Well, um, first, I was the only person on the team from West Virginia. Oh, Ooh, okay. Yeah. So I had that pressure on me. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like when a lot of people think of West Virginia, they think of hillbillies and they don't think good things. Right. right. So whenever I first got there, I guess, I don't know, maybe some people didn't like me or they were like just they assumed things just because I was from West Virginia. Yeah. I think that's so, what it is. Yeah. I think I, we've all we know that. that. We know yeah. that. I we know how that works. Yeah. yeah, I didn't like that. I did not like that at all. Mm. Like, the first few months was rough. I was like, dang, like, these, I'm on a team full of people. None of them are from here. They're not even trying to talk to me because I'm from West Virginia. So I feel like I had to, like, break that. And after I broke that, I gained more confidence and I started to do better. Yeah. And I think those folks also kind of looked at you and are looking at you totally different mm-hmm. now. I, I, and how, how does it feel now with, you know, and I can, you know, and Hollis, you, you can probably relate to this too. Mm-hmm. There, there's a place when you walk out on the field, walk out on the track, walk out on the court. There is, there is a place when you walk out there like, like you know you belong out here. Mm-hmm. And, and everybody else Y'all need to figure out, you know, yeah. what y'all going to do. But I already know that I, I, I belong out here. Mm-hmm. Is, 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 that, is that where you are now as, a, as an athlete? Yeah, I feel that way now. But I still have a lot of work to do. So. And, and, and mentioning that, like I said, you, you were the freshman of the year in the conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and you actually, we, we did really well in a couple big meets. I know Marshall probably had the biggest meet this year, mm-hmm. correct? And I, not only did you do well, but I think the team did actually pretty well in that meet. So how was that experience competing? Because I know in several of our meets, we were competing against D1 athletes, and mm-hmm. we were w- beating D1 athletes. Yeah. So how was that feeling? Well, at the Marshall meet, if I'm being honest, I just wanted to beat Marshall. <laughs> there you go. So go Jack. I had to win. <laughs> See what 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 I what I like what I like about what I'm hearing is even though that was that may have even been a little tough to say, you said it, mm-hmm. and I think. You know, I go back. My mom, my mom, and and my dad. They they were they were adamant about saying what you want, mm-hmm. saying what what you believe, mm-hmm. and when you say it, now it puts you in a spot that where you have to. Gotta you, go do you, it. you gotta go do it. Yeah. And when you're thinking about going to do it, I, I'm gonna make the case you're probably never gonna put yourself in a situation where you're out of shape. Whether it's in season, out of yeah, season, you shape, yeah. <laughs> you, been working. Yeah, you, yeah, I've you been gonna, training all summer. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I, I, I went to run today, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and and I think and 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 folks who are listening, we're talking about someone who is enjoying what they do, the process, the process, and they love the challenge of. People wanting to be faster than them. But the goal is to be the best. Mm -hmm. And they're working out. They're not sitting at home (laughs) talking about how good I am. They're out doing the work. And I think that that is what we miss. I think Mm -hmm. that's the hardest piece to get into somebody's mind is the work that that it's required. We've had Mm -hmm. thousands of conversations about this. And Having you on the show and having you say that yeah. just clarifies it. I mean, it, to be good, to be great, the work ha- you have to put you in have the work. To put in the work, and, and let's switch gears. So you, you said you got into track because you were kind of a rambunctious kid, is what I'm mm-hmm. uh, gathering. What did you grow up watching the Olympics? Because we have the Olympics coming up this year. It's in Paris, Shakari Richardson. We got some 
great, great Olympic athletes. I mean, some of the preliminary events have been just great. So did that have like an influence on you growing up? Yes. And who, I, who did you watch? Um, I think growing up, one of my favorite track athletes was Allison Felix. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when you watch it, when you watch it today, when you're watching the Olympic, all the Olympic trials and all that kind of stuff, when you look at it, what are you, what are you seeing? What are you, what are you getting from it? Is there something that you're watching? Because it's not just entertainment. It's, it's you. Like you're seeing yourself in it. You're watching this start. You're watching this person finish. Tell me a little bit about what that, what that is for you. Because everybody knows that it's got to be different when you're looking at it versus me looking at it. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're, you're, you're getting something from it. Well, it's making me happy that track and field is becoming more marketable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, like, professional track athletes don't make a lot of money, but track athletes like NIL deals and stuff like mm-hmm. that, like, track athletes are becoming more marketable. And that makes me really happy. It, it, now, is the Olympics a goal for you? Is that something you aspire to do or, like, Diamond League track or anything like that? Yes, I do want to go to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. The next Olympics is in L.A., I think. Yep, mm-hmm. So I want to go there. And it was a, we just had a, a – I think she ran, I want to say, the 800, uh, a young lady from Ironton, Ohio, which is, you know, right across mm-hmm. the river. She just now made the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the Olympic track team. So that's close to home. So that's somebody, you know. It, it it can be done. It, it it can definitely be done. And it was some D, D2 athletes and Absolutely. D3 athletes that made the Olympic team. Have mm-hmm. you have you done some research to see what it what your times are going to need to be? Have you done that kind of work? And when you looked at the times that you're going to need to to let's say qualify, do you see that within your reach and and have you started that trek toward that Olympics already, or are you still kind of like you still got a little bit of time and you're just kind of working with, at state to just be the best athlete you can be there? Um, I've been training towards it. My track coach told me that if I keep up the work that I'm having now, that I could go maybe pro in a couple years. Mm-hmm. Um. I just have to make trials in three years, four right. years. Right. So, I think I I think I can do it. And, and give the and, and, uh, West Virginia State University track coach what's his name? John Boisset. Yeah, we gotta give him some. You know, we gotta give him a little <laughs> shout he's out. He's doing there. an amazing yeah. job. Yeah. yeah, he's doing an excellent job. And what I like about when you talked about the NIL deal, when you talked about exposure, what I loved about him and what he was doing on social media, I thought he did an excellent job presenting you guys on social media. Mm-hmm. I mean, you guys were all over the place. Whether it was uh, IG, whether it was Facebook, or Twitter, whatever, and I think the way he presented it, it was like, man, this is this is something big that's going on, and so I, I love what's going on down there. And let me let me give a shout out to Attorney Frank Walker. Real talk, real experience, real results. FrankieWalker.com. Just so that we get a shout out to our buddy Frankie Walker, we want to make what's sure what's going we, on, Attorney Walker. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have. We need to actually get him on the yeah, show. Gotta we got to get him on the show. So, yeah. so is he? He's not in town though, is he? He's West Virginia, Pennsylvania. So he he has law practice in both states. All right, yeah, we got to. You know, Frank, we got to get you on the show, man. All right, so <clears throat> when you from from this point on, from state to the Olympics, who is the challenging person that you see? That's that's whether it's Somebody at another school, somebody at at state. Who's the who's the one that you gotta beat? Not saying that you haven't beat them, but who's the? Is there a challenge out there that you want to conquer? Well, we already done Marshall, so that we can X that off. Well, the yeah, list. Yeah. We can, we're gonna hit X that off the list. He, he's liking that for me, okay? He's digging at me on that. X that off the list. <laughs> so yeah, who is there a school? Is there a, a person? Is there something what's the what's the goal who's the who's that person that you're like okay I want to run against that person because I want to show that I can beat that person um there's this girl from Lenore Ryan mm. <laughs> she's a so- no she's gonna be a junior this year I'm gonna be a sophomore I think she won nationals 
with a 1096 as a Man, sophomore, right. which that's really good. Wow. <laughs> so I want to be able to run against her. I know I'll run against her during indoor season. So I think if my indoor season turns out the way I think it will, I think I'll be close to her. Okay, so how's that, how's that indoor? How are you thinking that indoor is going to go? I think it's going to go amazing. <laughs> okay, okay. I just want to hear it. I want to hear it. And when does indoor start? Um, the first track meets in the beginning of December. Okay, okay. And what are you? And what are you? And before we go, what are you majoring in the state? What's your major? Social work with a minor in psychology. Nice. nice. Where? Okay. So when is that? When is when is that first meet? The indoor meet? Because well, we, we, we're gonna have, we're gonna we're gonna have to yeah, we, we, we gotta we gotta we gotta check it out. I'll, Cause I I want to see you. I want to see you run. Well, last year it was in Kentucky. Um, at this new complex near the Muhammad Ali neighborhood, somewhere oh, around there in okay. Louisville. Okay. Yeah. And it's nice. Like, I ran against people from Stanford and Texas, Longhorn. I'm mm. like, these people were fast. So I want to get up there and run their time. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I love about track because track is one of those sports where you compete against everybody. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. It's not necessarily – you're not just pigeonholed to your conference or even your division. You compete – you get to see – you get a taste of what it's everybody's kind of, doing. It is kind of really like a national kind yeah. of a thing um, because whatever your time is – is the time. It's the time. It's the time. And it's competing against anybody else that's in, in that, that time. In that yeah. era, in that age bracket or class or whatever. You've got to you've got to compete in that. Which to me, I think I think the confidence has to be there. Yeah, like you, yeah, yeah. You you can't. It's all on you. Yeah, you can't. There's there's no there's no. Re, see, I can always say, well, hey, if a couple guys up front do a little something, yeah. that'll help or the me. Safety, they <laughs> yeah, the safety yeah. covering my back. Yeah. They you ain't got that. Me. You don't yeah. have none of that. Yeah. It's just you and the clock. You yeah. know, and 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 like I said, I loved I loved track. You know, and 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 I'll say this, my track coach. At Marshall, I, I ran track my senior year just to get ready for, you know, professional football. And he tried to get me to run the 400. <laughs> and and I was running the 100 and the 200. The 200 was, like, killing me. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, man, I can't. I, I, I can't. I can't do it. I can't. I, can't, <laughs> I don't want to do it. Fast forward two years and now I'm I'm playing professional football. My training is 400s. Yep. I'm running four 400s. I put them at state yes, as, as a test. Yeah. Four 400s, four 200s, four 110s. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all on the clock and and recovery time. Yeah, and so recovery like recovery time. Yeah, you had recovery yeah. time. Like you might have had like about a minute. In between thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Once you came through the line, you got you had about a minute. To, to recover, and then you right back on the clock. I would, and again, in hindsight, I so wish I would have ran the quarter mm-hmm. because that that is the run. Yeah, that that helps the hundred. That helps the two hundred. Mm-hmm. And as 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 terrible as it is, I would if 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 I would have that opportunity again, I w- I would have run. I would have. Definitely run the quarter. And, and what is and speaking of that, like what is your off season training looking like? Are you lifting weights? Are you strictly running? Like what does that look like? Whatever you did this morning, what does that look like for you as far as or is it technique? Like what are you working on as a premier uh collegiate track athlete during the off season? Um I've been doing technical. Let's face stuff. it, bad things happen to good stuff. people. Seriously injured in a car accident, training. trucking accident, or even yeah, wrongfully trials. arrested. Life happens. Mm-hmm. And when it happens to I, you, you will are, need sound are, legal advice and fooled. aggressive. Representation. That's that you what don't we call have Attorney Frank Walker at 304 413 0179. That's 304 413 0179. Lock it in your yards. phone, text it to a friend. 304 413 0179. Or visit online and at attorneyfrank.com. Like full tilt. Like you can't get 95 and start to slow down because somebody's going to get you. Yeah, and I and I and I, I don't think that they understand the reality of mm. where that endurance running comes from, and and why it's important. And 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 being a um like a female athlete, being a woman athlete, how how are you 
when we look at sports today, there's a, a emphasis on female sports now. Like yeah. it's kind of in the limelight. Like whether you're talking about track, Shakari Richardson, whether you're talking about basketball or a whole host of other sports. So how is that like coming up in this era and having the spotlight on women's sport? Um, I like it. Like I don't really think of it that much though. I mm-hmm. just I like it though. Okay. Good, yeah. I guess maybe we think about it more because mm-hmm. it just wasn't like that. I mean, obviously track and field is something we always paid right. attention to when it came around. But I think we're paying attention to off season and like I said, it's just an, an emphasis on women's See, and, and, in and general. I would if if I would again, I I'll, I'll just say this. I think trying to be part of that I, I like I would want to be part of that new thing. Yeah. You know, and again, if you if you keep going on at the pace that you're going, you're going to be in that you're going to be in that conversation. I mean, you're here cuz we know about you and that's going that's only going to keep growing and it's going to put you in that in that limelight to potentially be that person. And trust me, you, there's no reason why you shouldn't enjoy the idea or the possibility of that being you. Mm-hmm. You know, right. because if why not you? I mean, at this point, like, you, I mean, you're out. I mean, you're the one out there. You know what I'm saying? You're the one that's out there. You are the one that we're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so before we wrap it up, you have anything else you want to say? Give a, your IG, give your, you know, your social media information. <laughs> anything else you want to say to the people? No, there's not anything else I have to say. Okay. okay. Well, like I said, um, we wish you the best, best of luck this season. Like, continue to grow. For we want to see you in the Olympics. So we want to see. We want to say we was the first to interview you. Uh, yes. Can we say and, that. And yes. Yeah. And, and 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 we're gonna come. And Hollis will have to tap me on the shoulder and say, mm-hmm. hey. We're coming to we're coming to a meet. Yeah. Okay. And 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 we'll watch you because we're going to support you all the way through. Okay. All right. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. Let's talk with Carl Lee is presented by Attorney Frank Walker. Real talk, real experience, real results. FrankWalkerLaw.com. Comment on episodes, ask Carl and Hollis questions, or suggest topics at our Facebook page. Search for Let's Talk with Carl Lee, and remember to like the page to become part of the conversation. Let's face it, bad things happen to good people. Seriously injured in a car accident, trucking accident, or even wrongfully arrested. Life happens, and when it happens to you, you will need sound legal advice and aggressive representation. That's when you call attorney Frank Walker at 304-413-0179. That's 304-413-0179. 0179. Lock it in your phone. Text it to a friend. 304 413 0179. Or visit online at attorneyfrankwalker.com. Find previous episodes of Let's Talk at WCHSnetwork.com slash Let's Talk. This is Let's Talk with Carl Lee. Now back to the conversation. Hollis, uh, Candace, I think is is one of those kinds of young ladies that I think is going to be actually like great. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's just special. I mean, coming from a place where you are the premier, you're the top track athlete in the state, and you go to a new program, and then you have similar success. Yeah. At that level, at a new program, at a different level, competing in not only against D two athletes, but you're competing against D one athletes is a special thing. And again, like you said. With a new program, new program. Just, just starting. Just started. And like literally months before she, she gets right, there. Right, right, yeah. right. All right. So one of one of one of the interesting components that I think in sports today is the growth of a host of different sports. And one is definitely soccer. Yeah. Soccer has become um, the go-to sports for yeah, a lot of yeah. families. It, it, yeah. it, it has become the go-to. Even in our youth football um, league and our team, we had a, we have a couple of kids who are not going to play football this year that were pretty good in football, and they're going to play soccer. Mm. You know, and again, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to compete against it, or to say something like, "Oh." No, you should play football, not soccer. It's that that 
And it's hard, and, and we'll get into it, but yeah. it's hard to compete on a lot of different levels. Uh, 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 a lot and, of... And we're uh, we're yeah, going to get all into that. it. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that, but, yeah. Yeah, but, you, but you're right. Yeah. Right. So I want to introduce our, our second half of the show, our new guest, Chris Kessel, West Side Soccer Association. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. Because Hollis, if you if you say to me West Side and sports, mm-hmm. I'm automatically thinking football. Yeah, and I want to I, I, I want to make the case from Chris. You 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 grew this program from 15 players mm-hmm. to 275. In six years? Yeah, about six years. And what ages? So uh, in the spring, we go everywhere from four-year-old through their senior year in high school. But, you know, obviously in the fall when scholastic soccer is going on, it's U4 through U12. And we had 275 kids this spring. Wow. And former president of Canal Valley Soccer League, Uh the the largest youth soccer league in West Virginia? Yeah. (laughs) When I was president, we had about 3,000 kids. That's, in, that's covering the county, that's, right? That's, Canal and Putnam County. Canal yeah. Putnam County. And you hold a multiple coaching license in the United States Soccer Federation. Uh-huh. Um, you do camps. Yeah. Clinics. Uh-huh. Um, even pick up soccer. Yeah. So all this is all on the all, – all this is all West Side? Yeah. Or yeah. is it – Everything – so um, West Side Soccer basically covers – the east end and the west side, right? Yeah. We play at Cato Park up on the west side hill. And um, so all of our kids, the, the vast majority of our kids end up going to Capitol. Uh, we got a sister program, Canal City Youth Soccer, that in, all their kids end up at Capitol too, mm. that we work hand in hand with. Uh, not as, like we compete on the field, but we like collaborate off the field so that yeah. everybody works together. But yeah, we're pretty much um, Piedmont Elementary, through the West Side, and, and so let me let me start by saying this, like, because I know, which this is a youth football is a subject, a sore subject for me, and I hate talking about it. Coach, didn't tell you that. <laughs> so when we seen, like, at least in this area, and maybe some other areas, who people from other jurisdictions that are listening, when we see the decline, is kind of what happened to youth football, maybe in basketball, baseball, in some iterations. How were you able to not only grow this league? but sustain it over these past several years? So there's been quite a few things that we've done. Um, So just to kind of touch on this, like I've been a youth sports coach for over 20 years. Okay, and and okay, hold hold that thought right there. Because when you say that, tell me what what youth sports, because I'm curious about where that all is and how that. So one of my mentors was Paul Gilmer. Who okay. at Midwestern, I coached yep. at Midwestern um, Youth Football yep. with Mike Farrell. Yep. And Paul was one of my mentors in youth sports, right? He showed me the proper way to run an organization. Y'all were talking with Candace about Striders. You know, he was an integral yep. part of making yep. Striders what yep. it is and what it was. So he helped show me how you run an organization, how you treat your volunteers, how you recruit people. And, um, like, I've taken those lessons onward you know to to soccer which soccer was always my passion i started playing i'm 48 i started playing when i was five so and i still play now two three days a week you know it's a lifelong sport so i continue to do that so i took those things that i learned from football which i didn't know anything about football when i started coaching i played one year i was terrible i didn't like getting tackled and i didn't like tackling (laughs) people so football wasn't for me right but like to coach i felt like i needed to be the best coach that i could be so i went to coaching clinics i i befriended capitals coaches uc coaches state whatever so that i could learn and absorb how i could be the best teacher of the game that i could be right So I had this experience of I didn't know anything and I didn't know how to coach or the actual like intricacies of the game. Right. When you watch football on TV, it's one thing. But when you're trying to teach a kid who doesn't know anything, it's a totally totally different different thing. thing. Totally different thing. So I could take that experience also and go, okay, Hollis is going to be a new coach for me. I know he was a college quarterback. 
I can now frame the game of soccer in a way that he can teach children that he doesn't need to know as much about it as me. He just needs to know more than the kids that he's coaching. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we do all of our coaching education through our program, it's we try to set it up in a way that we help parent volunteer coaches like understand the game as it relates to a child, to whatever age group they're doing, instead of going, okay, well, I need you to know as much as, you know, the Manchester City coach. Or just not knowing anything. Right. So I, so, yeah. what, so, what is the education piece? How, how does that, how do you facilitate that? So, um, there's a couple of things that we do, which um, before every season, after every season, and every summer and every winter, we offer coaching education to every volunteer in the program. So a lot of our coaches participate in it. They want to come. They want to learn. Because, like, um, a lot of volunteers, they want to be good, right? Like, you just have to help engage them in this learning process. So we come out. We give them coaching plans. We show them what the activities look like. We show them the coaching points that they could, they should do. Because just going out and, like, running a drill is just running a drill. If you don't know how to correct the mistakes that your children are making, and if you don't <laughs> know what mistakes to look for, right. right, you don't actually know how to coach them. You're just actually running an activity. See, and I'm going to – I'm gonna, I'm gonna Take you back to I'm not gonna ask you the question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out there mm-hmm. and maybe Hollis will a- answer it. Mm-hmm. When you go when you start talking about youth football, mm-hmm. I think the lack of understanding, the lack of actually knowing the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody has watched football and everybody kind of has played it a little bit, but that doesn't necessarily Let's face it, bad things happen to good coach. people. Seriously injured in a car accident, trucking accident, injured in a grocery a store, coach. or even wrongfully arrested and, and or falsely accused of a crime. One Life of the, happens, and when it happens to you, you will need sound legal in, advice in, and in aggressive representation. That's when you call is, attorney is Frank Walker at 304-413-0179. That's 304-413-0179. Lock it in your phone, text it to a friend. 304-413-0179. Or visit online at attorneyfrankwalker.com. Maybe with youth football is that there is no there's, there's a lack of structure. Yes, so you're not actually sending these coaches again volunteers who you know doing the Lord's work, but you're not actually sending them to be schooled and educated about what they're doing. I, and I don't, I don't, mm-hmm. but, but to I agree, yeah. and I'm trying to make that same point. But I think that a lot of those coaches think that they do know. Yeah, I mean, but you you don't have a choice if you've never like been taught anything else. You see what I'm saying? I, okay, so you, you're gonna so, have to you're gonna have to know. Like if if I'm not if I don't have any other like education, then I just I kind of just go with it. I gotta well, go with it. Right? So one of the things that I think that um, we tried really hard to do was to create a culture of learning amongst the volunteers. So even though we have these very Um, structured coaching education activities that we do. We also have like a Facebook group chat with all the coaches and we have like all these other times when we compare like, well, what are like my kids are struggling with X, Y, and Z. Like what, what can I do to help that? Right. So it's okay. We've made it okay for people to ask questions. We've made it okay for people to, to admit that they're not the best that there is or that they're an expert in everything. Right. We're all still learning. Like I still go and participate in coaching education at every opportunity. Right. Like I'm not coaching, I don't have aspirations to be a college coach or anything like that. I just I love coaching kids from the neighborhood that I live in. You know what I mean? Right. But I still want to go out and be the best coach that I can be so that when I coach my coaches or when I'm coaching the kids, that they get the best version of me that I can be. Right. And we try to facilitate that culture amongst our coaches as well. And, 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 And you talk about culture. And you, when we were talking Saturday night, you mentioned a phrase, a philosophy, if you will, mm-hmm. to me, that it's, and you can talk about the not keeping score, you can put that in there. Okay. But you said to me, it's about participation over winning. Yes. Participation over winning. Yeah. Which was hence why you have three thousand kids playing in the in the two counties so where did that philosophy come from and how has that manifested in the success of this organization because it is not that is not the typical 
no. concept when it comes to youth sports at all. So yeah. there, there's a couple pieces of it. So, like, um, the league, the Canal Valley Soccer League has been around since 1979 or something, 1978, something like that. It's, it's the same league that I played in with his kid. It's never, like, there hasn't been all of the youth football drama of a league collapsing in right, another right. it's like been the same thing and it's been a similar way i think the whole time i don't really remember what it was like when i was like five but um it's we try to make everything player centric right because what you want is to make all of the decisions around how your team exists how your club exists and how the game exists for the betterment of the child and not the betterment of the adult right so <laughs> Um, that's that we've really made that now, obviously when you have 3000 kids in the league, we have hundreds of coaches, everybody's not going to be great, but in our club, we try really, really hard to hammer this home, right? That when we are playing these games and when a lot of people hear that we don't keep score in the games, they're like, Oh, you don't want them to compete. No, trust me. The kids know the score of the game. Right. Right. But we don't have standings and we don't keep a record so that when coach Chris is coaching the game and I have to make sure that everybody gets 50 percent playing time in every game, because that's the rule that we abide by. Right. I can substitute a kid in because we don't have standings. You know, when it's time for kids to play more than one position instead of trying to hide, you know, this little girl over here where I think that she's not going to hurt the team. I can play her at center midfield for 10 or 15 minutes because that's what's the best thing for her and her development as a player. It might hurt the team today, but I want everybody. Frankly, uh, we have a goal at Westside Soccer to help Capital High School win state championships. Right. It's not to win a bunch of U10 championships like nobody cares. Like my daughter just graduated from Capitol this last year. And I asked her the other day, I was like, how many tournaments did you win as a kid? And she could literally only name one. And she probably won about 15. Like we put too much emphasis (laughs) quite often as parents into like results when children are little, when we should be worried about the process. Right. And I heard you mention that earlier, and I wanted to touch on that because that's something that I'm I'm really, really big in, right? Um, I talk about this at almost every session, no matter the age group. I want these kids to think of being the best version of themselves mm-hmm. that they can be, right? Whether, you know, in, in when you were talking to Candace earlier, Candace earlier, you know, you, you know, you were talking about being the best version of herself that she could be. That's what I want these boys and girls to think about. That's what I try to get my coaches to think about. And that's what I try to get them to express on the kids. Also, if you're not out here working on your own, you're not going to be the best player you can be. You know, if you're not serious about getting sleep, eating right, working out, taking care of your body, getting good grades, all of these things that we have an opportunity to, 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 um, to talk to kids about in this setting, right? You're not their parent. You know, they're going to listen to you. Like, I know that my son, who plays for Capital right now, <laughs> listens to Coach Freeze way more than he listens to me about his grades and stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, his grades shot up because he had a leader at Capital High School Boys Soccer that, like, focuses on their development as people, right? Oh, okay, so so let's just back up for one second because I think you 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 dropped a couple gems in there and I don't want them to get lost in right. this. In the fact that when you focus, number one, I think, and this from what I'm hearing, you correct me if I'm wrong, the focus is, is organizationally about how this organization is structured in order to develop kids. Mm-hmm. And I think in comparison and in contrast to other sports, I mean, I think I would compare this most likely to baseball, how they go through like a T-ball, coach pitch, Mm -hmm. and all that sort of system. Right. But when you talk about maybe youth football, youth basketball, it it seems to be a lot more Mm adult-centered. So organization – Driven. driven. For sure. How how do you – like, how how does that happen? Like, how, how do you how do you keep the focus to where the focus should be? So the the very first I, day and you, and you do some stuff that I like you to touch on. <laughs> yeah. So, well, the very do some stuff. the very first day that I took the program over. Right. Um, I was asked to take it over the the the, the pro the West Side Soccer had fallen on some some hard times. It was down to around 15 players that were going to return the next year. I met with the existing board 
and I kind of went over goals. I was like, the first one, I want this program to look like our community, right? Soccer generally is thought of as upper class white kids Mm -hmm. playing soccer out in the suburbs, you know, or always travel, whatever. We have probably I don't I don't know the exact numbers but we're around 60% minority participation at West Side Soccer. Yeah, it's, right. It's, yeah. it's Hollis surprising. Has, Hollis yeah. has seen it, right? Yeah. We have team the, the U12 girls team that I coached this season literally it was every it was 17 little black girls. I had zero. I mean, yeah. it's just the way it happened, but like so I wanted the program to look like the community. I wanted the board to look like our community, right? So I make sure that I purposely find board members that are from the west side, the east end, that that look like the kids that play, right. you know. And I wanted our coaches to look like the community. And it's a lot harder when basically all white people have been playing soccer, right? So to find, you know, black men and women to come and be coaches. And luckily, you know, I found some magnificent but, coaches. And that's where the education piece and comes into play. the education into play. piece comes into play, right? Yeah. So when you sit down and you say, hey, we're going to be around, about the kids that are from our neighborhood, that look like our neighborhood, and our coaches and our board are going to be from our neighborhood, everybody's focused on one thing, the kids, right? And that's that's exactly what we sat down to do from the beginning. And see, and, and, and Hollis, kind of to your point or to the, even to your question – When you talk about football and you talk about basketball and you talk about the coaches, you talk about a host of some of the parents, Mm -hmm. it's it's not the development. Mm -hmm. It's 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 my kid. Mm -hmm. Like the the attention is on that kid and or just winning or just winning or and, Mm -hmm. and, and for the most part, that coach can't handle it if he if he doesn't win. Right. And. And we've had we've had this conversation, and I've said it a thousand times. Like you know, I you know losing at Marshall, you know I won maybe seven, eight, nine, maybe max ten games in four years, but I wasn't going to leave mm-hmm. because of the people, because of the coaches right. that were there that I felt were invested in me, and 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 gives you, and they'll give you prop, and I and I and I've said that I think those experiences are better mm-hmm. than if you go youth, middle school, high school, college, and you're overly successful, your teams are overly successful, because at some point in time in your life, something is gonna go bad. Yeah. Something is gonna go something's gonna go south. And do can you and do you know how to handle that? Yeah. Yeah. And and, and I some and, adversity. And, and, yes. and I want to get back to because I think in addition to, like I said, just being able to handle that adversity, getting kids outside their comfort zone, right? Because mm-hmm. if I'm the goalie and that's my thing and then you pit me as a defender or a striker, striker then I ha- I'm, I'm outside of my mm-hmm. comfort zone. So I have to learn to be adapt. And even that yeah. is kind of building adversity Absolute, within the yeah. confines yep. of the organization and the structure. But what I want to place emphasis on is that number one there is an organization and a structure Mm -hmm. and you guys do have a like a end of the season tournament where Mm -hmm. it is competitive keep scoring you got to win the thing but (laughs) what i noticed and i went to that tournament this year and you do verse and there's something very special that you or (laughs) i don't know maybe emphasis at this point that you guys do with the parents that come to you guys games what and what they're allowed to do and not do what is that yeah, so I mean, for West Side, we have a parent meeting before the season where you don't your kid you don't know which team your kid plays on until you come to the parent meeting. Then we announce it, and at that we give out like a handout. It's seven pages long, and it's like <laughs> what we expect from you as a parent. It's like sideline decorum. It's like how you handle the ride home from the games. It's uh, what you talk to your kid about. How you ask them. And it's just things that are common sense when you hear them. It's like, well, what's the sideline decorum? Please expound on that. Okay, so some of the things are like, we want you to be a reactive cheerer. Like the worst thing that you can do is yell at your kid, pass it, shoot it, whatever. Like you're making the decisions for them. You don't go into math class and tell them what the answer is. We need them to make the decision out there, right? So great shot, great pass, you know, great way to hustle. 
right? So we want you to be reactive in your cheering, not proactive, right? We don't want you to tell them what to do, so, right? So, don't yell at the referee, right? Like the the what we don't we if if you yell at the referee, you get kicked out. That's that's zero, like no tolerance. Like I've wow. kicked people out. People have not left. We've had you know we've had to have people removed. It's zero tolerance, right? Because a a lot of the referees for soccer are teenagers, right? You can start refereeing when you're 14. Yeah. And so you you really out here as an adult yelling at a 14-year-old over a, an 8-year-old soccer game. That's what you think is appropriate. <laughs> well, we don't think that's appropriate. It's time for you to go. Okay, so 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 just just entertain me on this because I guess maybe a purist or a traditionalist in some sentiment would think that this is some new age poo-pooing trying to hold their hands you're not letting the kids be exposed they may well, there, there has to be pushback on this philosophy that you guys have implemented hold on let, 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 and I want to I want to kind of respond to that I don't have his answer yeah. okay but to your question what we are doing now we clearly know is wrong yeah I mean I guess I, that's yeah, 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 yeah 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 and if if you're a parent and you're hearing this and you're and you if you're even remotely offended or like oh I would never do that you you are wrong but but I, but I don't see I don't think so because when you're used to doing it like for him to tell me this for Chris to tell me what he's telling me I have never even remotely heard of me anything either. like it me so you can't say that they're wrong when we grew up this is how we grew up and this is yeah. this is our tradition and how we do it things. Is. So I'm saying like how, how do you combat that the pushback? Like what's so, what's the response? So what what we've done by doing this and making that the expectation is is it's sort of empowered the parents to police themselves on the sideline. Like mm. it, it's it's a whole lot of hey hey chill out Hollis. Like you know, you you know we're not supposed to be doing that over here. You know and it, it's just created a better sideline dynamic, right? It, it's allowed people to also understand that, like, A, you're probably embarrassing your kid yelling at the referee. Like, when you hear somebody say that, like, not like when you're mad and yelling, but, like, just in a setting where we're just sitting around talking because this is really the kind of atmosphere it is, it makes you go, you know what? It probably is embarrassing. I mean, because when I went to the game, <laughs> bro, when I went to the game, it was quiet, yeah. And and there was some criticism of the refs, but it wasn't like that it was like that ref missed that call. Like parents talking. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. like yelling, yelling it projecting. Out. Right. It wasn't like and for me it's it it it, it, it kind of is alarm it just cuz I'm used to the energy being a right. little different. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but uh -huh. do it, have we have we just not thought to do that in basketball? Have we not thought to do that in football? We have not thought to do that. Well, it's, we I'm going to be, I'm gonna to be real honest. It, it's hard at the beginning, right? You have to be willing as an adult administrator to go and tell people they got to stop, right? And that's hard. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, luckily, you know, the people around the program respected me and respected what we were doing and they listened, you know, um, our problems aren't from the parents that play for Westside. Our problems are always parents from the parents from the yeah. other clubs, right, who aren't used to what we're trying to do. And, you know, it, 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 it was hard. But after a few years, it becomes a culture. Like I keep touching on that, the culture around the program, the culture around the club. See, so, so that's I'm, where we got to build it. Yeah, yeah, that's, the that's so the problem. When you start talking about – I'm already aware. I'm 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 coming in with my visiting team, mm -hmm. and we're coming to your place and we're playing, and I'm already aware of how this structure works there. Mm -hmm. I know how this is going to go. Now I I go I can go play Hollis and it's a and it's a whole other thing. But I know when I'm coming to the West Side that there's a structure there that our parents need to understand, our coaches need to understand, and our kids need to understand. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah, and see, and and this is why, like, I wanted to have you on it, and really, we we got to bring you back because we need you for like a whole segment. <laughs> because no, because what I think is that when we talk about, because nobody talks about this part of what we struggle with with youth basketball, youth football in this area, and probably state, is mm -hmm. that 
we have a bad culture associated yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. with those sports. Even baseball to a degree, what I've seen. But I think, again, baseball is different because you go through a whole maturation process. Yeah. But I think particularly when you're talking about basketball and football, we have a bad culture. And the culture of it needs to change where it is development over wins. It's participation over yeah. Over so, wins. You know, the funny thing about that is, right, like we, we preach that and that's how we've structured the whole program, right? But the thing is, is when you develop players, the byproduct of that is you win. You win. A lot. Yeah. Like, like frankly, like we focus on this as our number one goal and we win a lot of end of season tournaments and as the kids get older and play, you know, in you know, obviously once they get to be 14, 16, we're playing – like tournament games and league and whatever all the time. And, you know, we win a lot because of it. Because we focus when they're 5 to 10 to 12 years old on development, like the byproduct is winning. And and that's what I'm saying. Football, basketball, there's very little development. It's very little development, and it is a a whole lot of (laughs) yelling and Mm -hmm. screaming at the officials, at the coach, at your kid, telling your kid what – what he's supposed to do, she's supposed to do. That is that is a, a complete norm yeah. for basketball and football. And I don't even know I don't even know how that groundwork could even start. I, I think you would I, I think how it starts is it has to start. Yeah. Yep. I, I don't yeah. I don't I don't yeah. think it, yep. it, it, it ain't gotta be no big thing. Nope. And and the thing I like I said, I, I think that because I know that I coached one year at, at the youth level. I've coached like middle school and high school and even college. But I coached one year at the youth level. And at the end of the season, we went to like our little conference championship. We was a game away from like the big championship. And I look back on the season as a complete failure because I failed to develop the kids. I got so obsessed with the winning part of it. Yep. That I think I I, I I lost the program because even if we were less successful, mm-hmm. I think that it would have been more successful had it been a developmental piece as yeah. opposed to me focusing solely on winning. Because to your point, Coach Lee, what happens is is that you just pit the ball in the fastest kid's hands. He runs around the corner, and if you can do that twenty times a game, you'll do that just to win the just game. Just to win the game. Instead right. of having that kid. Run the ball, throw the ball, block, play defense, do all the things to see play exactly. Play a couple of different positions. Yeah. A couple yeah. different yeah. positions yeah. to see exactly. Because mm-hmm. I know when we was coming up uh, playing for Western Generals, you had to play line your first year or tight end if you were good. Mostly you're not coming in playing running back your first year on whatever team you're on. Right. And it goes towards that development. Yep. And I think we've lost that piece. And particularly with football, that's the sport I'm around the most, it's all it's just become about winning. It, it's, yep. a, it's about nothing else. It, 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 it totally is. And we're, and we're getting ready to – we got to kind of wind it down. But it is, it is, it is a shame that – Sports has come. Specific sports have become solely about winning, mm-hmm. and they're missing this teaching, this culture that you guys have yeah. on the West Side. And and it, and I'm I'm super happy and proud that the fact that you know the kids that it is touching can absolutely use it and need it. Well, and, and you know, just, one, let, let me, me ask you this okay, question. Ahead. So how can other sports or organization mimic this? So, I mean, I think that creating, like we, we keep harping on it, but just creating a positive culture around everything, right? And putting the, the players at the middle of everything you do, right? I just, like, when we talk about participation, it's more than, it's more than just, like, in these games and in, in the club, right? When you, when Coach uh, mentioned the pickup, like, Every Friday night, all winter, we used to do it all the time, but like it was just, it got to be too much for me. But we do free pick pickup, like indoor soccer at the King Center. We got a partnership, I remember that. right? We got we got forty, fifty people come from all ages, college play, current college players to little kids. We all play together. Saturday mornings at Cato Park, we had over sixty people at pickup this week, including current college players, adults, kids. We all play together, right? Participation in soccer is different than participation in football. It pretty much ends at high school for everybody right. with football. Like I said, I'm 48. I still play every week, like a couple times a week. Like we're trying to create soccer players for the rest of their life, right? Like if you are, 
you know, a track the track coach or you tennis or baseball, softball, all these things that you can keep playing for a long time. A lot of this, you need to remember that you're trying to create healthy, active adults also. Right. And Mm. like, if I can continue, I've been trying to get Hollis to come and play pickup with us for a while because I think he would love soccer if he played once. But, you know, (laughs) I'm I'm, 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 I'm about to see you all on a Saturday morning. I'm going to text both y'all. Right. Like it's it's about being healthy, active adults. Also, when these kids are 10 years older than they are right now or 30 years older than they are right now, if it wasn't for the coaches that made me love the game when I was little, I wouldn't be playing now. Mm. All right. Well, we got to get out of here. So, Chris, I appreciate it. And, and man, what a great, great, great thing that you're doing. And, again, I think that's one of those kind of things that we, we got to get out of the studio. And I want to actually get eyes on it myself. So, yeah, sure. all right, I'm going to one more shout out to my sponsor, Frank Walker Law, Real Talk, Real Experience, Real Results. For more information, you can go to frankwalkerlaw.com. All right. We will get back with you again next week. Let's Talk with Carl Lee is presented by attorney Frank Walker. Real talk, real experience, real results. FrankWalkerLaw.com. Comment on episodes, ask Carl and Hollis questions, or suggest topics at our Facebook page. Search for Let's Talk with Carl Lee. And remember to like the page to become part of the conversation. If you fall, dust it off and get back up on your feet. Anything could be a win, yup, even defeat. They say sugar bad for you, why is victory sweet? Couldn't play with big kids, I had to sit in the street and watch from a distance. But over time, I grew. If I put in the work in no time, I'm due. Everything that I worked and prayed, I'm okay. If you ask me, how did I do it? I'm gonna say, you gotta work. Grind, shine, it's mine. Gotta show everybody it's my time. Getting here, you gotta work. Grind, shine, never mind who talking down cause they lying. Don't talk, you gotta work. 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 You gotta work.